In the many years that I've been at UCLA, most recently as anthropology department chair, I've been honored to work with many remarkable colleagues, phenomenal students, and distinguished alumni. One of the most satisfying aspects of my job as chair has been connecting with alumni who have changed the world in important and unexpected ways. Today's keynote speaker is an excellent example. Lori Duthie was an anthropology graduate student here at UCLA. Lori's research was on Chinese business executives working with foreign multinational companies and the link between global capitalism and sociocultural change. For this research, she won prestigious grants and fellowships, including Fulbright Hayes, Wintergren, and the Mellon Foundation, and also was awarded the Eric Wolf Prize from the Society for the Anthropology of Work. While at UCLA, Lori discovered the need for culturally focused consulting to corporations. Prior to her in-house corporate roles, she established a consultancy providing tailored solutions for human resource needs, including international team building, cross-cultural communication in the workplace, and a cultural boot camp for foreign CEOs new to China. Her clients have included Gap, Starbucks, and Unilever. Overall, she spent 18 years working in China, most recently with Apple, and then Yahoo. Now Lori is Director of Talent Acquisition for Yahoo Incorporated in the United States and oversees the recruitment for the firm's global product teams. Lori remains passionate about connecting people across oceans and cultures and about facilitating inclusive work cultures. She works with Yahoo's international teams and incoming Yahoo's to promote the spirit of collaboration in the diverse cultural space of Silicon Valley. Please help me give a warm and proud welcome to one of our own former students, Lori Duffy and our 2015 Department of Anthropology commencement speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Levine. It's great to be back today, and congratulations to our anthropology graduates of 2015. I am deeply honored and truly humbled to be invited to here to celebrate with you your second rite of passage as an anthropologist, your graduation day. Let's give you all a huge round of applause. Now you may be wondering, what was the first rite of passage as an anthropologist? Well, that of course would be when you went home and announced to your families, you were an anthropology major. <laughs> and if your experience was anything like mine, the cognitive dissonance associated with rites of passages was more experienced by your parents. It was the look of confusion, the conflict they now felt in promising you could be anything you wanted to be, while forgetting to add that clause of commonly accepted, seemingly practical, and so-called traditional majors. No, indeed, they had raised an anthropologist. In a state of liminality where the mythical and real collide, your family may have mumbled something about Indiana Jones, Margaret Mead, Jane Goodall, or simply sputtered out, what is an anthropologist anyway? And indeed, what is an anthropologist? In fact, as, as we've mentioned, many of you will go on to be doctors, teachers, lawyers, social workers, and everything in between. But you will always be anthropologists because you have learned to ask questions of what others take as a simple truth. You have learned to analyze multiple factors and their complex interplay, where others see it in black and white. And you have learned to perceive and articulate power dynamics when others around you simply accept that this is the way the world works. You have a boundless curiosity to understand others' experiences more deeply. You are a seeker of knowledge and asker of questions and a voice for justice. If you lean on this desire to examine the human experience more closely, it will carry you far in whatever you choose to do. For me, one of my first jobs 
was with Lion Nathan, an Australian brewery in China. They were launching a new beer, and I was set out to head up human resources for the sales team. Oh, and by the way, my boss said, the sales team hates HR. My first day meeting a team of all Chinese salespeople, much older than I was, they confirmed it. Yeah, we hate HR. And then they looked me up and down. A 24-year-old blonde chick from America sent by a bunch of Australians to fix things in China. And so I did the only thing I knew to do. I did field work. I hung out with the salesmen. I asked endless questions. I went to lunches with them. I went on sales calls with them to bars, restaurants, convenience stores. I got to know their customers as well. And eventually, there was trust and respect and a relationship where there had been none. And when the all-male sales team objected to hiring a saleswoman, I was then able to talk to them, to convince them to try this wildly experimental idea of hiring a woman, and they eventually agreed. A year later, the guys in the office thanked me. Not only was she the top-ranked salesperson on her way to a promotion, but they actually and genuinely loved her. And it was only through my anthropological toolbox that I was able to build the relationship that created space for change. People want to be heard, people want to be understood, and when you make the time to connect with them on their terms, as only anthropologists can do, they are much more likely to listen to you. There was another factor in this situation. I was working with leaders who were great mentors and supported me. Truth be told, there were at least 10 other jobs I didn't get before landing this one. There was the fancy management consultant in Beijing who told me he couldn't possibly see a connection between business and anthropology. There was that top London law firm who never even called me back after the interview. And then there was a soft drink company. And they told me I had the job. And when I asked about the career path, I was told women don't go far in, in that department because they don't like to work late. The crazy part is, I really wanted all of those jobs. They, would, they sounded great, they sounded prestigious, and my family knew what that soft drink was. But the truth of, truth of it is, throughout your lives, you will encounter a great deal of people who don't get you and don't believe in you. And no amount of prestige in your university, company, or title can turn that into a productive situation. The head of human resources at this brewery, which few of you have probably heard of, sat with me and taught me about HR as, whoops, sorry, Nance. Um, and he supported me and believed me, believed in me, and thus gave space for my anthropological voice. And when it came time to later find a graduate program, the anthropology professors at UCLA stood out in similar ways. Doors were open, and the students unequivocally spoke of the time and commitment their prof professors had dedicated to their work. When I came to visit campus, Dr. Yen invited me into his office, sat me down with a cup of green tea, and said, now tell me about these yuppies you've been hanging out with in Shanghai. And to this day, he has remained the deepest of life mentors. We have been lucky to have a faculty who doesn't just spend time with us, but also holds amazing accomplishments, the most prestigious in the academic world. I remember when Dr. Oakes agreed to meet with me so I could pick her brain on my research with families in China. In hindsight, I'm not sure it's totally appropriate to ask, can I pick your brain of a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient? But Dr. Oates, Oates, you are proof of our amazing and patient mentors here at UCLA. In this era of Facebook, Twitter, and everything else coming down from Silicon Valley, we often forget the courage it takes to do what many of our professors have done. Dr. Levine went home and didn't just tell her parents she was an anthropology major, 
She added in that she would be hanging out in rural Nepal with some pastoralist friends. And for the younger of our graduates, back when Dr. Levine went there, there was no Snapchat in Nepalese caves. In all seriousness, that is part of being an anthropologist. No matter where you are or what you are doing, you go there. We are there physically, emotionally, and authentically. Anthropologists live in the world, not alongside it. And it is this deep engagement that is part of our continuously curious minds. If you look at our faculty's body of research, it has changed over time. From Dr. Brandingham's research in China to now doing mathematical models of crime here in the States. Anthropologists like culture continuously change, and so must you. Be courageous enough to scare yourself with what you take on. Use your anthropological lens to find your way when you are lost. Ask questions, listen, and learn from others around you. And challenge the status quo when no one else will. Seek great mentors and then reach out to them when you feel alone. You are no longer anthropology students. You are setting out into the world as anthropologists. And you shall do well and you shall do good. And you have but one responsibility, to have your voice heard. And with that, I invite you and our guests to have our collective anthropological voice heard in a chant, possibly disrupting those so-called traditional majors I'd like you to join me on the count of three in a chant for UCLA Anthropology. One, two, three. UCLA!